Okay. Uh, yep. So today we're going to talk about contract creation with Power Apps AI Builder. Um, so presentation, good. Um, so I'm Sharon Sumner, that's very big on my screen, um, and uh, I run the Cambridge Power Platform User Group. Uh, I'm also recently a Microsoft MVP, so yes, still going on about it. Um, very pleased to be an MVP. I'm a massive evangelist of the Power Platform at anything Office 365, um, and I've been, I come from a place of SharePoint, so I've been in data and, and SharePoint from the very beginning, and now being able to leverage that and put some tools in place that end users can create themselves is a fantastic place for this whole development cycle to be. So very excited about where we're at at the moment. Um, and yes, I do always say yes to a coffee, even a virtual one in current times. So the whole premise of what we are doing uh, currently in the situation that we're in is creating communities. So communities are themselves the groups of people that get stuff done. So it's these like-minded or similar outcome focused people. Now that naturally fits itself into uh, a department or a function within a commercial enterprise, which is where I'm gonna take you today. So what those communities do is they work as a team and their goal is to get the thing done faster than they could have done in any other way. So we're going to look at getting the right information to that team in the right order using the single pane of glass that is Microsoft Teams with these technologies behind them. The idea being, though, as always, as I think is the Azure motto, is to make the technology hidden, uh, absolutely um, not visible to the end user, so there is no confusion, no complication, and no technology uh, that is going to confuse end users. So it's making the solution palatable. So the contract management community came to me with a request, and what they said is, can we have a system that does these two fundamental things? Actually breaks down to three. Um, so what they need is to quickly generate documents, but they need to do it from some core data. So you've seen these documents. We're talking about contracts. We're talking about NDAs where you need to fill in the gaps with the relevant company information that you're contracting with. And so part one of the solution is to create those documents. And then the second part of that is to then convert documents that come in into a list of data with renewal and monitor and manage that renewal process. So a lot of contracts are annual um, and, you know, it, you don't want somebody to have a full time job literally administering all of those documents. So we need some automation. So let's look at the document lifecycle that we're particularly talking about in this instance. So the first thing that you do with a contract is you create it. And this is really phase one. Um, so first of all, we have a standard contract and we have some specific details that we want to merge into the two. And that really forms the document that you then send out to get agreed. Now, anybody that has ever raised one of these documents will know that it does not survive first contact. So the document itself will iterate, which is why we create it as a Word document at that point, so that dates can change, names can change, scope, pricing, anything along those lines uh, can iterate as it gets passed backwards and forwards to make that document become something agreeable and, and OK by both parties. When that happens, we get to the complete phase and the customer will sign whatever the final version ended up being with data that potentially isn't the same as we entered into the first list to create the document. Um, at that point, we then need to monitor from that data that came in the renewal process, who's involved, how frequent it needs to be, who needs to be contacted to get that whole process started again. So then that breaks down into needing three steps. And this is how we looked at, at completing those three steps. So step one is to create the contract. So using SharePoint, uh, surfaced fire teams, and then Power Automate under the hood to fill in the blanks of that template document. Then we need, uh, because it's gonna take on its own life cycle, then we need something to be able to read that information back in without us having to retype it back in or to have to amend the original data list. So then we're looking at something to convert that final PDF that we've probably got that's been scanned in uh, into some data to be able to track uh, expiry. And then finally, we need to monitor that expiry and notify the relevant people when something needs renewing. So 
Uh, contract automation part one is one of the pre-recorded videos that I've already done. Um, and that's already up on the Global Azure Virtual site. This is the, uh, the link to the channel. And we also have a link there directly to uh, my previous video. And I'll make these slides available afterwards. This is also embedded if you just wanted to hit play from there, which I won't do. So that really ticks number one of the three. And so it's these other two that we're going to look at today. Before we do that, let's just outline the challenge a bit more. So for this particular part, we're looking at the signed document. So basically a PDF has come in and we need to extract the contract data from it um, and then process that list. So extract the contact date, contract data is our primary goal. Um, so typical uses, again, so this could be used in any context. So any uh, NDAs, we in my business, we use it for statements of work, NDAs, uh, master services agreements, those kinds of things. But you could just as easily use it for anything that needs those predetermined fields filled in or then extracted out. So anything that is uh, or can be uh, summarized to be data that needs extracting in the same format to a list can use this technology. So we're going to use Power Apps with the AI Builder module. Um, now, this is a premium service. Don't ask me about licensing. <laughs> Not even going to go there. Um, and so we're looking at the PDF reader version of the AI Builder. So this is a pre-canned, uh, already packaged uh, version of Azure Cognitive Services leveraged within the Power Platform uh, environment itself already pre-built for you. And I'll show you just how easy it is for you to make uh, a Power App using the AI Builder. And we're going to do that live today. So we're deploying via SharePoint as our data source and Teams as our front end to, again, remove the complication for the end user. So just really quickly, let's just quickly cover off in case you don't know what a Power App is. So Power Apps are the info path, in, I'll get it out, info path replacement. So where we used to have uh, SharePoint form customizations using InfoPath to do fancy stuff with uh, the data under the hood, if this, then that kind of decision making. Now we have Power Apps to do that for us and they extend much further than that. They've become a business process automation tool to be able to take data or to use data to help you fill in. They go again, they get wider and wider in that you can have um, Power BI coming into a Power App or the other way around, Power Apps built into Power BI. They are definitely a mobile app development tool because out of the box natively, all Power Apps uh, that we're talking about today will be available on a mobile device. Um, again, no code, low code. Um, the very essence of this presentation is to show you how you can go away and do this uh, on your own. And again, I'm going to show you a relatively vanilla um, implementation of this so that you can put your own slant on it as to how it applies to your organization. Everybody is a snowflake um, and everybody needs it implemented slightly differently. So also Power Apps are part of this, of this master trio. So we've already used Power Automate or previously Flow, to show you how to build the, the document in the first place. Power Apps and then Power BI are the power couple that also come with Power Automate to make that Power Platform trio. It is exceptionally easy to get started with, as I'll show you today, but it's also a really powerful tool if you're a pro developer as well. So please don't feel put off if you're a pro developer thinking, oh, this is the naughty version of something else we've got in Azure. And, and yes, you can go and achieve similar things with cognitive services and, and putting things in .NET and, and MVC and, and Xamarin. But what this does is it also allows pro developers to have some fun too. Uh, one of my developers, as we'll be putting out on the community in the next month or so, has developed a, uh, a complete clarity version of Pac-Man within a Power App, completely playable, leaderboard the lot. Um, so pro developers, uh, given the motivation, uh, there's plenty in there for you too. So really, we've got two types of Power Apps. And again, I'm, I'm just covering this from a 101 basis in case you haven't had any exposure before. So Canvas Apps, which is what we're going to play with today, and the model-driven apps. So model-driven apps are largely putting a process on top of Dynamics 365 uh, services. And so this one doesn't really apply to what we're doing. Um, whereas the, the Canvas app, called such because it starts from a blank canvas, is a more flexible and because we're only looking at SharePoint as a data source rather than a, a more complex uh, database, 
uh, where you would want to carry some completely complex and transactional data. So we're just using a very simple data source to store that data and we're doing very simple transactions on it. So Canvas Apps is a better fit for us in this scenario. And then how are those Power Apps consumed by users? Well, again, we've got the, the, the standard on your mobile or in your browser, but what we want to cover is making it available within a team. And there's really nothing complex about this. Once your Power App exists, we can very quickly, and again, I'll show you today, uh, pull that into a team environment. And it means that it is here and it is relevant for the team that need to use it. So let's just give you a quick summary of what we covered in the uh, in the first video. So I'm just going to play this short video. And what I've done is I've done short videos without sound that I'll talk over just so that I don't have any problems with my demos. I've seen a few of those today, so uh, it's probably a good call. So what you can see here, if I just play the video, what you can see here is already got a team set up and I've got two components at the top here, contract details and contract completed contracts. So with the system that we already put in in the short video, which again, you can follow along to, we can now add a new item to the contract details, which is the part that's going to fill in a document, and it will go and create that document for us. Now, under the hood, we've got a, a Power Automate or a flow that lives in Power Automate. I'm still not quite sure how we're supposed to talk about that. Um, that's um, where we can uh, process whether this is a simple document type or a statement of work document type. So we fill in uh, an entry on contract details. Uh, for example, we've got new contract here for Sharon's new company and over in completed contracts, um, we would then have a flow in the background that would have gone down a condition statement to bring us to uh, creating the correct type of file with the correct input. Um, this is just me checking the flow and the point, a point to note here is that it takes 60 seconds for a flow to run and when you're creating a document like we've done on this one, it's then probably going to take a further 60 seconds for that to complete execution, okay, because it is in the steps, I'm not going to expand all of those, but in the steps it does show that we are creating the uh, document from the template and then we are saving that into the correct location with all of the correct data. So there's a little bit of prep to be done on the document types that you use um, and there is uh, a little bit of conditional statement needed in here for working out which template it goes and picks up. So if we shoot back to the team we'll be able to see on a refresh that that document has now appeared and if we go into the uh, contract details we can see that that list created this document. And then going into the document itself, you can see that it pre-populated some of the data from that list. So you can see my name is in there um, and there are a couple of other details that we could search for. So that's largely what we covered in the first part of this season. Um, and then we need to move on to the second part, which is um, bringing together the, the Power Apps side of things. So let's run through creating this. So as you can see, we already have the team and it's the same team as before with the uh, completed contracts and the contract details lists. So now what we need to do is create the Power App that is going to now read in a document once it comes back from that process. So we're going to go into Power Apps and we're going to create a, a AI Builder is already here for us. We're going to create a model in our AI Builder. Uh, again, you can see that I'm using a trial license here, so you can have a play for 30 days without any problems. And we're going to use the form processing rather than these others. These others, again, are pre-built, uh, ready for you to use, like the business card reader. There's lots of demos of these online. We're going to pick the form processing one. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a model and then train our model to understand how to interpret the documents that we're going to give it. Now, again, it's not as simple as passing any kind of a document. There is a format to use for documents that you want to be able to extract data from. And largely uh, for the technical community, we're talking about like a JSON pair. Uh, so a tag and a value uh, for everybody else. You can see what I've done here is created a summary sheet to go on the top of every document. And this is what we filled in with the with the document populator that we did in section one. And that summary sheet has got all of the fields 
in the correct format. So we have a field heading and we have a field value. So as long as we have the ability, what this will do while it's analyzing um, is it will, um, it will show us uh, the fields that it can uh, make sense of. So this is, I'm doing this live, I'm not speeding this up at all for you because I think it's important that you see how quickly uh, this gets processed. Usually just when I give up is when, <laughs> when it actually finishes processing. So what it's doing, I've given it six documents, they're all the same type, and it's now analysed those documents and said, what fields would we like to use? to just pause there for one second. I think we might have an audio problem. Hello, Sharon. Okay, I'm not sure if anybody can hear me, but I think Sharn is trying. No, nope, we're back again. We have that noise is back. It's like someone drilling outside. Okay. That's it. Perfect. Okay. Sorry, I think my headset died. I have been wearing it all day. <laughs> no bother. Okay, I'll hang up and let you go back to it. Well, thank you. Okay, does anybody know where I got to before that happens? Uh, maybe jump back about two slides. <laughs> two slides, thank you. Oh, I might fill the time slot now. Did we see this one? Uh, what was the one before that? The last one that I saw here that it was sound on it when it started going for me was when you were uploading the four documents and it was showing the oh. scanning. Okay, that's on the next one, I think. Um, okay, let's... Sorry, my mouse has disappeared. Oops. OK, let's play this one. Um, OK, so what I was saying was that we already have a team established and we already have these two lists where we are creating those initial contracts. So uh, what we need to do is then create the Power App that's going to now scan the documents once they've come back from signing. Apologies if I'm repeating myself. So the first thing we need to do is to build the model in the AI Builder. So what we'll do is we'll jump to the AI Builder and build. This isn't a free service, so you do need to either buy a subscription or you can play with a 30-day free trial. So we're going to use form processing 
um, rather than the others, which is one of our uh, cognitive services wrappers that's already been done for you by Microsoft. So once we start the form processing, we now need to give the model a name and then we need to give it some documents to build the model around. So what it's going to do is it's going to look at the content and try and work out what's consistent in each of these documents to make it uh, able to predict what content it is you want to extract. So I happen to have uh, a few documents here for it to play with. And as you can see, probably from those documents, they're all in exactly the same format. So what the uh, predictor needs is it needs a tag and a value. So it's looking for that in each of these documents. So a standard contract where you've just got uh, a company ID somewhere else in the document is not going to be analysed in this way. So to get around that, you can see that what I've created is a summary sheet that goes on the front of every document. Um, and what that summary sheet will do is that will be analysed and that will contain the data. So it's important to keep that up to date with whatever it is that you put underneath that got signed. So this is uh, real time analysing those documents. And what it's doing is looking at every single one of them and finding those commonalities. So it will then take us to this process where we pick the fields that we need. And you can see it's already guessed where those fields are because it's in the correct format. Now, I personally had a learning curve putting lots of documents through here to try and work out what would make it pick the fields. And it is that uh, that it has a tag and it has a value. So I'm going to pick all fields. And as you can see, I could change the name of the field if I wanted to. I don't believe I saved that. So um, I didn't hit the tick anyway. So we now have nine fields selected and we're going to publish the model. So publishing the model um, just means that we first have to train it. So what that does is it goes away and looks at those documents and how it might interpret them, given the fields that it needs to look at. So it's gathering data, which it did very quickly. And then we go through the publishing steps. You cannot use a model until it's been published. So if you want to take a model out of service, you can unpublish it. Um, but that obviously is going to impact any apps that have been built on top of that model. So once that model has been completed uh, with the publishing process, we can then create a Power App from it. And what Microsoft will do is they will start up Power Apps for you when you click Use Model, Create an App and they will put that model directly in there for you. Now, that's not a massive improvement on going to Power Apps and calling the model in, but I definitely know that I'm using the one that I just published because it's got it in hand. And this process takes a couple of minutes, so we'll just jump to the next one and show you where that is once it's finished. So once it's finished, we get this lovely block that we can resize. Uh, it doesn't really matter what you do with that block other than being able to click on it because it doesn't give you an actual preview of the document. So if we just point to a document that we know is in the same format and analyze it, the system in the background is grabbing the data that it can see from those fields in that document. So what I always find with these Power Apps is that it is better or a best practice to analyze a document when you first come in because it initializes all the variables of the data within it. So what you can see here is that I'm putting a text input box in and I'll explain why text input later. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for the, the, the information from the model. So the model is called form processor one and I can address that by dotting and finding the form content. And from the fields, I can then see the, the fields that I want to bring out. So we can have a look at all of the things that we identified in the model for it to pick out. So two would be company name, contact would be the contact. So we pull out contact, we can see that from the data that we analyzed a second ago, it's now got Bob Smith. If we were to analyze a different document, we would get different data. So this is what's currently in memory. So uh, I can now just copy and paste these fields and slightly amend them so that we're getting different values out. And while I'm doing that, um, I'll tell you why the, the field. So rather than bringing this out as a label or just a value, what I thought was maybe it might have a hard time uh, interpreting somebody's name or it might somebody might have misspelled it on the document and you may want to make a last minute change. So that's why to put a text field on here so that the end user gets the ability to make a change before they hit the submit button. So what we're doing now is we're picking a different document to show you that dynamically and live that data becomes the data from the document that we analysed. It tells us at the top what the document name was, but now we've got that, that information coming through. And obviously, when you build your beautiful apps, 
uh, you will build, uh, you know, you'll put titles in and you'll make this a much nicer experience. But again, I'm just showing you in a vanilla way how to bring these details out. So the next thing to do is put a save details button on there. And now we want to save those details down to SharePoint in a SharePoint list. And that's going to require us to patch some data. So again, if, if I was doing this for real for a customer, I would have done it the other way around. I'd have done it in tablet mode. But when we hit the button, Microsoft picked to put this in the, uh, in the default mobile phone mode because in, uh, in Teams within that window, it's going to look a bit, a bit funky. So uh, please ignore those choices. Uh, we're just doing that for speed. So oops, let's, let me just move on to the next one. So the next thing is to create the SharePoint list. For those of you who use SharePoint every day like me, uh, you'll know this bit off by heart, but let's just show everybody for complete continuity. So if we go to the team and click the open in SharePoint button, and go to the top of the team, we then get the option to add a new list from the context menu. So we're going to have a new list called uh, contract signed. OK. And this is to bring in the data from signed contracts. So again, we're going to add some fields to this SharePoint list to populate with the data that we're going to pick up out of the document. Uh, we'll just stick with simple text fields for the moment because uh, having to patch anything other than a text field requires you to, um, you know, possibly look up what the format is because we don't do it every day. So back to Power Apps, we now need to tell it that that list exists. So we didn't close the app. We didn't save the app. So it doesn't have uh, any context. But what we can do is simply add a data source and go and point to that new list that we've created in SharePoint. So if we pick a connector of SharePoint and then we look for the SharePoint list now, it comes up in a list at the bottom and we can just click the list that we just created and we now have a connection directly to that list. Should we make any changes to that list while we're developing the app, we can right click on this uh, in your app sign contract signed and we can refresh that or remove it if we don't want that data source anymore. So we now have that data source available to us to be able to write that data into. So let's move on to I'm sure we can do that. Let's move on to how we patch that data into SharePoint. So uh, on the save details button, we simply use a patch statement. Uh, I say simply, it's, it takes a while for you to learn what this is, but once you've learned what this is, or once you've got um, a video on hand from, um, from one of the experts, uh, Shane Young, for example, you'll soon get the hang of this, or you can just Google it every time and just find out the format. It's not hard. It literally is this one statement. So what we've said is patch into the SharePoint list uh, where where there are defaults, set the defaults. Um, and in that list, we are then going to patch this data. So this data is in a JSON pair format. It is really important to put this dot text on the end or whatever that dot value is. And if it's a, a Boolean or a date, there is some um, some funky referencing that you need to do for that data type. So we're sticking to text in this example. Again, I can I'll help anybody expand this should they want to. And I think I've got a blog post which it takes this a little bit further and shows you dates and, and values. So within here, we are just going to take these three fields that we filled in and we're saying the title, which is from the SharePoint list. So title in the SharePoint list is going to be set to company, which is this field down here. You can see them all getting colored. So it's this green field here and the text value that we currently have in that box. So that patch statement really easy. And now we have a save details button that's got the patch behind it. If we go and look at the preview and we hit the save details button. In fact, let's analyze a different document just to show that we're getting the different document details through. And of course, the trick within Power Apps is once we hit the save button, if it slightly grays out for a second, then we know it's done the job. I'm going to change this one uh, just to prove that the changed value comes through rather than the one from the model itself. So it's gone pale grey. So we kind of know that that saved the data for us. If we knit back to SharePoint, even though we're only in demo mode, that's actively saving the data to SharePoint. And we can see in our SharePoint list, we now have the details of that document. So that document came in, we scanned it, uh, we have we then pointed the Power App at the scan document, and we now have the details back in a SharePoint list. So this is the very basis of what it is that we that we are creating. Oops. 
Um, so then how do we integrate that back to Teams and make that available for the Teams to use? So once we've done this process, we can then just add the Power App into the team itself. So at the top here, we can see we have the various tabs. So if we just search for Power Apps, um, and obviously there's a caveat here that you do need to publish the Power App and you do need to make it available to the users that are within that particular team. So I made mine have a, a green star so that I'd be able to see it quickly, and I called it Import contact, Contracts. So here is the app, and this is live in the Microsoft Teams experience. We can also then bring in the SharePoint document library that we are sharing that data, to, uh, so that, we, that we are saving the data to. Um, so, sorry, it's a SharePoint list. So we want the contract signed SharePoint list so that now we have the complete picture at the top here where we can import a contract. So we point the analyzer at a brand new contract. It very quickly, fairly quickly, <laughs> finds the data. We can then change the data if we want to change the data, or we can just hit save details. And then easily and quickly, we can just pop to signed and we can see that information already in our list. Now, ideally, you would have this navigate to a second screen that confirms that things have happened. And again, uh, I'm here to show you the, uh, the relatively basic side of doing this. So we're just going to analyze another one. We're going to change the data slightly. Let's have Claire Collier Jr. Um, and save that detail. So from an end user point of view, from just sitting within Teams, there's no knowledge of the technology that's going on in the background. They, they scan the document in and here it appears in the list. So it keeps things really simple, but we want a little bit more from that solution. If you remember, we had a three point list. So we've created the Power App to convert the final signed contract into the list data for the expiry tracking, but we haven't actually done any expiry tracking. So what we're going to need is we're going to need to bring out some dates and we're going to need to put some notifications on back to the team's environment, single pane of glass, where we want everybody to live, to tell them that there's something that needs doing. So let's crack on and do that. So as you can see, I've added in an expiry date uh, into the SharePoint list. So uh, I've just done that ahead of time so that we're not here all day just watching me add SharePoint values. So I'm now jumping to Power Automate to create a recurrence. Now, what we're going to do with this, because of the type of contract, so we're dealing with NDAs and they expire annually. So what we're looking at here is doing a recurrence of every month. Could you please go and run this flow and check if any items in that list are due to expire this month? So the way we do that is we just point to the list that has the data in it, so our signed contracts data. And from that list, we are then going to um, apply to each of the results. So we're going to scoot through every item in that list and using a condition. Um, so that condition is going to say if the expiry is going to expire in the next 30 days. So the way we do that is that we use the expiry uh, value, which uh, it's important that you pick the correct field here rather than expiry. Oh, no, it's just expiry on this one. Apologies. Um, and what we're going to do is put in a little expression. So we're going to say, is it less than or equal to? And then we're going to put in um, an expression that looks at uh, adding days to today. So add days uh, is a simple function that says from when and how much are you adding? So we're going to put in UTC now as today. And then we are going to add 30 days. So we're going to say, uh, we're going to run this every month and say is from today and within the next 30 days, does our expiry fall in that period? And if it does, then we're going to send a notification. If it doesn't, we're just going to let the um, let the no stay empty because flow just will stop at that point. So we're going to go through everything in the list and then we're going to find the team's action. Um, and these have changed actually since I made this video. They changed literally the next week, as you would expect. Um, we're going to use this um, flow bot to um, post to the channel because we know we're in that team and we know we're in that general channel. So what we're going to do is we're going to post to that general channel and just let somebody know that something is expiring. So um, on the first of the month, they're probably going to get six notifications. So that's probably not the ideal solution. 
what I'm showing you here is what's possible. You might want to do this expiry every day. You might want to do this expiry on a completely different uh, logic for that frequency. So what I'm going to do is just say something is old. And then we're going to put in a hyperlink to that item. So where it says check it out here, that should receive a hyperlink to that item. Now the Sharper HTML audience of you will have just spotted an error that I made, but I've left it in because um, no demo is quite right without a small error. But let me show you how this runs. So I'm now going to run this flow and because it's on a list, it will run the test dynamically for you. So uh, we can see that it's looked through one of one and that it has created as a notification. So let's jump to the team um, and go and have a look at that notification. And as you can see, I've got a very dodgy URL. So um, if I nip back to the flow and I edit, you'll see that I managed to put a capital A, which of course doesn't work in HTML. So we have to change that to a lowercase a. And once we do that and we rerun the test, we'll see that we actually get a decent message in that channel. So while the flow worked, it goes junk, which we're not happy with. So here we are, lovely. So something is old, check it out here. And if we click on that, it will take us directly to the details of that item. Again, you could have taken directly elsewhere, you know, whatever you want to put in that link in terms of the value from the SharePoint list it is completely up to you. We could have a complete adaptive card here showing the full data um, of that notification. So just to, to recap, uh, we now have imported a document. Uh, and let's do that again. Let's just pick any document. Ah, now. One thing that you're seeing here is I was trying to show you um, the expiry going to the SharePoint list. Um, oh, that's just picking the same document as we had before, so I'm just going to pick another one. OK, and um, we're going to hit save details. And you'll see that my expiry didn't appear. So again, this is a rookie mistake on my part in that I've updated the Power App but I haven't hit the publish button. So um, what I thought I would leave this in because this happens and um, it's important that you need to publish and you need the end user to flick between windows so that it loads the most recent version of the Power App to give you that data in. So as you can see, no matter how many times I hit the button, I'm not getting that expiry. So I do need to go back to my Power App. I need to make sure that I have the expiry value coming through and then I need to go and save and publish. Once I've published and I go back to Teams, like I say, a quick refresh between those two top windows, and I will now have a solution that is properly saving that data down. So I left it in because that's a bit of a gotcha that you could easily succumb to. I'm showing you here that uh, if, we, if we run and save those details directly from the Power App that it would have worked. So this version of the Power App works and does in fact save the details back to the signed list. So there we have it with the expiry fully intact. And now if we were to do exactly the same in the app because we've refreshed it, and we hit save, we should now see a Satya Nadella entry with a date. There we are. So it is important to publish and it's also important to make sure that you get the permissions right on that power up once you do send it out to a team. So looking back at our solution, we now have all three parts that were requested. So we can create a, a contract in the first place. We can then sc scan the signed contracts back in and now we have a solution for also getting contract expiry. And all the end user has is four simple tabs within Teams to add the data, to take the original file, to scan the, the signed version, and then we have the expiry. And that's really all I wanted to show you today. Um, I think I've done amazingly on time there by skating through at speed, especially considering we had an issue on sound. Um, 
But if anybody would like to see fuller versions of this um, or would like to talk through any parts of that solution or if there are any questions, please do shoot. Um, this is me. Uh, and please do get in touch. Um, would love to speak to anybody. That was absolutely awesome. Thank you very much indeed, Sharon. One of the things that always fascinates me about um, the likes of Power Apps and, and some other um, solutions like that out there is this low code thing. And, you know, for years, uh, this kind of concept has come out that, you know, something that's point and click or it's kind of, you know, a semi code will come out and it will um, automate stuff and it'll do us all away with jobs and everything else. But in actual fact, it's proven that no, it doesn't. What it does is it frees us up as developers to do more interesting things. Um, and uh, I think that can only be welcomed and embraced. So it was really Absolutely. interesting to see how you were able just to click that through and just make it so seamless um, and really lower the barrier of entry um, yeah. to maybe someone who isn't a, a, a um, completely deep dive, you know, coder, uh, but nonetheless has a very strong uh, technical knowledge and is just frustrated because they want to get stuff done and now they can. And that's really awesome. Absolutely. And again, if you want to make it complex, you know, there's plenty you can do in the background with those connectors to do some really good stuff and still leave the front end really point and click. So I would always say to, to proper developers, no, to, to pro developers, that there is plenty there for you because you don't have to worry now about that UI. You know, that bit's done. So you can do the interesting bit, the logic and the fun stuff in the background that make it jump through the hoops that we want it to jump through. Yeah, I think it was Charlie Mingus, maybe it was somebody else, but I always remember it being Charlie Mingus, that great uh, jazz player, um, saying that it's uh, uh, reasonably easy. Maybe it was Einstein. It's one of those folk. It's reasonably easy <laughs> to make something simple, complex, but it's not easy to make something complex, simple. And I think what you do is just do that there today. And, and certainly the, the whole power up um, uh, family. Um, to me has really lived up to that expectation and really, really pushes that out the door, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so um, we are just coming up now to uh, 10 to, we have um, coming up next on the track uh, is Mark, who's going to do serverless. Um, I know that uh, Mark is probably asleep, so we'll have to probably uh, what, what, get, what, get what, someone, what, what, get the local police to go and throw stones at his window or something to wake him up. <laughs> <laughs> He's been burning the candle on all of the ends, I think, to keep things going at the moment. So, um, Mark, do you want to start a wee bit early? Um, uh, that's up to you. I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I was sort of assuming that, you know, just in case anybody actually turned up for my session, I shouldn't start until the official start. <laughs> <laughs> Always a good plan. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, a, a quick question for you, Sharon, just, you know, just a general chin wag on the whole power apps thing. You know, you, you, you were talking there about, you know, you sort of did a Freudian slip there of proper developers. Now, <laughs> Apologies. Per personally, you know, I, I, I'm a, you know, an old school developer. I like the code, but I have, you know, I, you know, I love nothing more than a logic app or a power automate or whatever you want to call it these days of flow because it saves me all that time. But you yeah. do find that, do you find, you know, I, 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 I do seem to think, find that there's still a, a bit of sniffiness from coding developers about, this sort of thing that might save them time but isn't proper code do you do you see that from your side or? yeah i mean so there's a there's a lovely community um actually surrounded by uh, it's basically andrew welsh um and, and a whole bunch of people that are addressing this with the power uh, power platform adoption framework so what we're looking at is how to redefine um the fact that we've overused the term developer so, um, and, I, and I think it is one of those things that's been going on for years in the SharePoint world where SharePoint developers have been um, anybody that could that could create a list. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah. And it's created a lot of confusion, certainly when you're looking at contractors within that field. So I think it is important to get the terminology right. And I think certainly uh, Luis um, prefers the term makers. But again, is that is that already in place for the, the 3D community? So I think it, it is a bit difficult to understand what terminology can be put in place to say, um, people, parts of the process that need, you just need to get on with that are pre-packaged for you versus stuff that you've got to go and, you know, I, I, I do development, but I can't start with a blank sheet in Visual Studio and, and, and do C Sharp, um, but I'm still considered a developer. Um, that said, I live with a developer. So, <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, I could do pair programming. I can see what's wrong with programming. So I, I think there is a skill set that's kind of not identified. And we sort of do need that. Um, uh, we need that leveling. But again, people are just people. Yeah. So if you have some skills in the C sharp field, I'm not sure that that is the only thing that qualifies you to be a pro developer. It's it's an odd an odd place yeah. at the moment. I suppose if you, if you follow that, you know, you were talking about SharePoint just then. And, you know, I've always thought of SharePoint as being access for the web, you know, Microsoft access for the web. Um, and there's a lot ouch. of... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, ouch. I, I know, <laughs> I know a fair few systems that uh, are running in major banks right now um, and major hedge funds on a Microsoft access back end. And you would not believe the money flowing through those systems. Yeah, I, I was going to say, okay, you well, know, this, more it's amazing database. that's a stuff built on Access. And, you know, beyond that as well, you know, that that's only an extension really of Excel. And you would not, you know, the, the entire business world runs on Excel spreadsheets. Yep. I agree. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I think going so back to access, the thing. Sorry, go on. Apparently. <laughs> uh, access claims to be a database. And I think but probably actually might do it in some ways better than SharePoint does because SharePoint doesn't have that ability to to work with transactional data and certainly parent child data in the same way. So I would never advocate that SharePoint is a is a database. You can use it for list items, but going outside of that, it's, it's never going to be the right solution for a major uh, data structure. So I would always go to the common data service for that or something SQL in Azure. Uh, but what SharePoint is extremely strong at, which is why there are articles out there by me uh, called I Love SharePoint, um, is, you know, stick to your field. So SharePoint is, and I've recently written an article saying, is SharePoint a document management system? Yes, it is. And it's interesting that that is what it is and that people still don't understand if it is because it's evolved, because it's now got pretty and is it an intranet product or is, you know, but largely SharePoint is for document and information um, storage and accessibility. So surfacing through search and surf surfacing through metadata. So it's it's a knowledge and document management kind of platform um, that's just a bit too flexible. So everybody uses it. I was thinking about um, what you said there about the, uh, you know, terms for, you know, as a developer or engineer. And um, I know that you've recently got a an MVP award, which is awesome. And yeah. um, it really is cool. And uh, then there is, you know, there, there's the, the the Google experts and everything else. And I came into my head, of what, what could we do for these power folk, you know? And uh, I thought, how about Power Rangers? Oh, well, actually, so I work with um, Simon Owen over at uh, GSK, and he literally has the Power Rangers. So <laughs> they do lunch and learns. Uh, I made him come and present, but he refused to put the lycra on, which is unfair. So they came to my um, to my user group. They do lunch and learns, and he's gone from a few people getting together to talk about Power BI and Power Apps to something like 440 groups across the globe that are all dialing into this one session. And, uh, yeah, so I think he kind of stole Power Rangers, actually. That's awesome. Do you see much um, of uh, an uptake in business on Power Apps versus other types of equivalent solutions that are out there, maybe from other vendors? How, how are you seeing that kind of evolve? Okay, so I think um, one of the turning points in the development cycle was when we went from um, from a relatively uh, frictionless licensing model to a more friction license model. <laughs> I don't want to say too much. So it's it's tougher to understand the licensing model around Power Apps now, but effectively it took a step. So Power Apps and, uh, and Flow as it was back then started as a really easy access, couldn't believe it was built in uh, platform, and it then took itself to this premium layer. Now, what people didn't appreciate was that um, what people were creating in these apps were very quick and very easy, but also relatively low value. So what it did is it pushed itself into a place where you now need to determine the value before you can afford to go and create that technology. And now that's not a bad thing in terms of ecosystem because my whole uh, ethos is to get to business value. There is nothing that my organization will take on from a customer if we don't see that they're actually gonna benefit from it. And that's really the killer here. So there's a lot that you can do in these tools that's, you know, you could, you could take every email that comes in and put it in a document library, but why? What are you doing? What, what time are you saving? Where's the business value in that? So I think um, 
it's important now to determine the business value before you start creating the app. So we've got a lot less, um, I'm not going to say junk, but a lot less uh, smaller apps uh, and organisations with hundreds of apps. And we now have some really well considered apps and some really good stuff coming through and it's improving the product. Just talking there about um, uh, apps that kind of, you know, go by the wayside or ones that, you know, take traction inside the business and, and gain more value. Um, how do you deal with versioning? OK, so there is version control within the apps, but the best way to deal with it is a product that Microsoft put out there in conjunction with um, uh, Manuela Pilcher, who now works there, and uh, and also Keith Watling, um, which is the Centre of Excellence. So we now have a Power Apps um, or Power Platform Centre of Excellence, which is a bunch of tools that you can have in the background that show you who own apps, what version they're at, uh, and all of those things. So it's summarising all that data in an admin interface in the background, much like uh, some of the Sentinel stuff that we were looking at earlier that allows you to kind of see across the platform. So it's tools like that that are evolving that are going to make that easier. And also we're getting best practices around how many owners you should have an app, of an app, because obviously if I own an app and I leave the organization, nobody else can use the app. And again, with Power BI, we're looking at uh, data sources having a value of, you know, uh, approved by the organization or just a data source. So people will use the approved data sources. So it's evolving into a mechanism so that you know within the organization which are the right ones to use. Um, and we have a bit more control in the back end of being able to say doesn't meet the criteria. You know, it's it's going to get unpublished automatically. Is there anything out there, you know, funky, um, a bit like, a you know, an app store or the Azure marketplace where uh, someone can say, hey, I developed this thing that's really cool and really useful um, in Power Apps. So it can be sort of brought into any organization. Is there any kind of sort of um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so we have a Power Apps and a Power Automate uh, community sites where you can submit your Power Apps um, and what they do. So we'll be putting Pac-Man up there this month. So uh, what we did with Pac-Man is we wrote that in Power Apps. Uh, we used it at a few events and now we'll give it back to the community. So um, what you can do is you can package it in the right way. It goes through some, some Microsoft, um, you know, it has to be um, completely labelled in the right way and, and what have you. But then once Microsoft are happy with it, exactly like the app source, it goes into that community library. And I think TDG, uh, the um, the Dynamics guys, have got a website that's also got some patterns, uh, et cetera, on there for people. 